futures of higher education. This is the first one in a series of three. Um, I obviously hope that you're all safe and well. Um, we initially thought we would have a small group of people uh, to attend the webinar, but uh, we realized very quickly that we went over 100 people and now over 300, so we had to adapt, which is a, a good thing. Uh, we hope it's not only because you're bored at home, but uh, because you like the topic and that you definitely also wish to engage with the speakers here. Um, we're thrilled to co-organize the series of webinars with the Boston College Center for International Higher Education, and in particular with Hans de Witt, um, and on the IAU side with the IAU Manager Internationalization, Giorgio Marinoni and a dear colleague in Moscow, Ekaterina Minaeva. The major questions that we will be discussing here today are uh, the trends and challenges for higher education and research in the global uh, context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we will also look beyond and try and, and look into the looking glass into the future. The second big topic that we will touch on is the tertiary education systems uh, for the 21st century. Where are we at and where are we heading? And we will have a third speaker on the future of higher education, again in the shadow of COVID-19 and then zooming in more specifically on South Africa. In complement of the webinar, I would like already to make a little bit of publicity to a special issue uh, that was uh, prepared by the Boston College Center for International Higher Education, and that is the International Higher Education Journal uh, that now uh, features um, uh, in its special issue 102, 102 uh, special issue on the impact of COVID-19 around the world. And you will find there, in addition to this webinar, 35 papers from around the world um, painting um, a rather uh, interesting and very diverse picture of the world um, on what is happening. And some of the speakers of today also committed very good papers to that journal. There are papers from Asia, Latin America, Africa, Europe. So we encourage you to read that as well. We will put the contacts in the, um, in the chat. So three webinars. The first one is today on short, medium and long-term perspectives around the world. The second webinar will take place on 12 May, and we'll look at perspectives from mid and low income countries. And the third webinar in this mini series will be on the future of internationalization of higher education. And again, the short, medium and long term perspectives. So the speakers we're very pleased to welcome to this webinar are first um, Ellen Hazelcorn, of whom you, you've heard a lot. She writes a lot these days as well in many different platforms and takes place and takes part in many webinars, which is excellent. You have a lot to share, Ellen. You're Emeritus Professor, Higher Education Policy Research Unit at uh, the Dublin Institute of Technology in Ireland, but you now run an international consultancy firm focusing on education, BH Associates. Roberta Malibasset, is the Global Lead Tertiary Education and Senior Education Specialist at the World Bank. Welcome as well. And Ahmed Bawa, welcome to this webinar. You're the Chief Executive Officer of University of South Africa. So a good mix and good perspectives that we will hear from you. On the moderator side, we have Hans de Witt, who's Professor and Director of the Center for International Higher Education, Boston College in the US. Giorgio Marinoni, the IU manager, internationalization. And we also benefit a lot from the support from Ekaterina Minaeva from the High School of Economics in Moscow, who made this possible through this platform. So we welcome you all. And I give the floor to Hans de Witt, who takes over for this first part of the seminar. Thank you, uh, Hilary. And uh... Welcome everybody to this uh, first of three webinars of uh, the International Association of Universities together with uh, my Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Uh, as Hilary said, it's a great pleasure that we have uh, three experts talking to us uh, today. Uh, and uh, uh, Hilary already have introduced themselves, so I don't have uh, to uh, repeat that. 
uh, also uh, to give as much as possible time for them to present. Uh, we first start with uh, Alan Hazelporn uh, for speaking around eight minutes and then Roberta uh, Bassett and then Ahmed uh, Bawa will speak. Uh, after that, it might be that I uh, ask them to reflect on each other's talks briefly. And then uh, the idea is that we will, based on questions that you can put in the chat box, uh, uh, we will ask them to respond to those questions. And I and Hilgi will be trying to moderate that uh, for the next um, uh, time until the end of the, the webinar. So uh, without uh, saying much more, uh, uh, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Ellen Hazelkorn to give her first uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Right. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me and thanks very much for to IAU for inviting me and also to all of you who are joining us. So I want to give a kind of a broad look on some of that, what I think are a few of the key issues. I'm not going to talk a lot about internationalization and students because I know that's the topic of another of another event. So um, next slide, please. Right, so a couple of general um, comments. So obviously it's clear to everyone that the remarkable and unprecedented impact that this, that this um, pandemic is having on everyone and also on higher education. I think the pandemic is likely to accelerate existing trends, things that we already see happening or what um, are, might be referred to as underlying conditions to use that medical term will be amplified. I think the role and impact of higher education as a driver of economic recovery in respective countries will become even more important than it has been over the last while, particularly since the 08 um, global financial crisis. We've seen a lot of uh, conversation about the nimbleness or agility of higher education as quick responsiveness. And in this, I refer to research. I think a lot of those lessons will be mainstreamed and let that's a bit of a conversation as, as to which aspects. Um, and the issues around the system and the, the tertiary system and institutional stability will raise a lot of questions about the overall balance between different providers beyond just the universities and beyond just the elite universities to looking at the rest of the sector. And I think um, Roberta is going to talk about those issues. And finally, institutional leadership and strategic capacity will be more important than ever. So next slide. So just four issues I want to look at very quickly. System governance, uh, um, labor market skills, research and science and internationalization and multilateralism. Okay, so the next slide then. So on the system level and system governance, so looking widely, there has already been quite a lot of discussion going on internationally at the policy level about what constitutes the tertiary or the post-secondary um, system. And um, a lot of the discussion about survival and which types of institutions are more likely to be challenged and this balancing between public and private providers, different types of providers. and how will this be determined? Um, what's the process and is it, will it just be survival of the fittest? Um, and we have also seen to me that to see a lot of discussion going on, which has also been going on for a while, is about what we call economic or learning ecosystems, how different parts of the post-secondary -ter post tertiary system fit together. So a lot of work going on about higher education, but also higher education in relationship to what we might call further education in the Irish and um, UK and to some extent US experience, but also vet vocational education and training. So I work a lot in that space and a lot of discussion around those governance issues. And particularly, I th and increasingly as we look at issues around effectiveness and efficiency and how we look at these issues, are we looking at autonomous competitive institutions or more collective sense of looking at the system and how every, everyone works together, this notion of collectivity and overall um, sustainability. And then that brings us to this issue of money. 
Money has been a big topic of conversation across the board. It's all about how systems are going to an institution survive. But what does financial sustainability look like? There's a lot of submissions being made to government about funding, but does the funding extend beyond the elite research universities to the rest of to the rest of the system? I did some numbers the other day. If we looked at the top 100 institutions according to let's say the Shanghai rankings, that constitutes about 1.4 percent of all the students in tertiary education. So does that? In many cases, have us relook at the financial overdependence on the internationally mobile students for those institutions that are looking at that, and these wider questions about impact and benefits for society in the region. So I think these issues are going to become much more central. So next. And then we look at the issue around the labor market and skills. We're already experiencing significance and looking at and forecasting significant effects of what the fourth industrial uh, revolution changes on the labor market and implications. And these, it seems to me, will accelerate as we look at the types of um, employments and changes in the labor market that are more likely to be affected. But as we see, a lot of jobs are being affected by the current crisis. So we're looking at the adoptability of new technologies, flexible flexible working, how much of that will remain for which sectors um, and how will that work, and increasingly the demand for higher levels of education. So all this will put increasing pressure then on institutions in terms of the attention to skills and graduate employability. If we thought this was a big issue before, it seems to me this is going to be a bigger issue now in terms of training and reskilling. and. This is this balance between supply and demand. The range of programs that institutions develop based on internal expertise, but yet their ability to meet changing demand out beyond, beyond their campus. And um, one of the issues that we spend a lot of time talking about entrance um, into higher education, universities and colleges. Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you so, okay. so please continue. Yeah, sorry about okay. that. Yeah, you know, I'm very sorry. So, um, so the issues around inequality, I think this will make us rethink teaching and learning, um, place making, new forms of credentials, and so on. I mean, we can discuss this um, later. Okay. So next slide. Um, then the other issue is is research. And science, um, we've seen an extraordinary amount of collaboration and networking. Exactly, this is a good example. Um, I think this the developments are likely to escalate and speed up the initiatives around open science and open access, the European Union's um, Plan S. This has also been supported, in fact, by the US and China and elsewhere. Um, and I think we'll see moving from a fragmented research infrastructure to a more open one, what's based on what's called FAIR, findable, accessible, and op interoperable and reusable principles, mixing research management systems, data, and so on. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. But there are implications for researchers. We see a lot of emphasis on the importance of experts and science, and we see the sci um, particularly public health and medical science at the fore. But does this extend to all disciplines? The social sciences and humanities have been less visible. There's some attention to funding that, um, but it's not clear and it's not clear how much money will be around and how that might be spread. And so what's the balance between targeted priorities and a longer term bottom up? We've seen some of this debate already at the European Research Council. This brings us then to this question about research assessment and the emphasis on impact. And finally, this increasing issue about whether or not global rankings are still fit for purpose as we enter a world in which it's much more complex and we really need to be thinking about the overall system and stop focusing on a few elite institutions. And then um, just the next one slide then is looking at um, internationalization 
and multilateralism. And really, we've had a lot of attention, as I said, around students and student mobility. Obviously, it's the key. Just come off another conversation, ex exactly looking at this at this issue. Um, will this prompt a reassessment of internationalization, which is less dependent on mobility? And will quality and accreditation become a key differentiator? And that seems to me it's not just um, quality assurance per se or accreditation, it's also the quality of the delivery and certainly the quality of the online. And this makes me move towards this reassessment or reassertion of the importance of multilateralism. Nation state solutions are likely to dominate. We see a lot of repatriation of, um, of talking about supply chains and, and so on, the renationalizing solutions, ultimately governments are gonna have them. But um, my, my argument is this is a time for an international assembly looking, for, looking at higher education and global research. And so just to conclude, a very sorry about the interruption, is to ask and to say, sorry, next slide, is to say higher education and research is an investment in the future. There's no doubt about it. But once the immediate crisis subsides, everyone is going to be competing for, for money. Every government is going to be under strain and is going to be constrained, no matter how much, how low interest rates are. And the question is, is does your system and your institution have the capacity and capability to respond to these changes and to the changed environment? Because many of these changes will remain and some will not, and some should remain. And the question is, how do we decide and what do you decide for your own institution? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, uh, for setting the scene with uh, these uh, four teams that uh, are uh, challenging the future of, of higher education and uh, in the world and uh, also addressing, uh, well, this whole environment of, uh, on the one hand, change that happens, but what is what really should change is the key question, as you said at the end, that we should address and sometimes we forget it because we go back to the normal old times uh, instead of trying to look what lessons and opportunities we can learn from um, this crisis. Um, thank you. Uh, if uh, Participants, if you have questions uh, for the panel, uh, put them in the chat box because that's the only way we can uh, manage the questions uh, uh, to the panel because we cannot do it uh, live. So uh, please put in questions and we will moderate that. Uh, and now, please, to give the floor to uh, Roberta Bassett uh, um, from the World Bank, and uh, she will give the second presentation. Roberta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Ellen, for a great setup, although I think we have a lot of overlapping positions. And so I'm going to move relatively fast through my slides. I believe these will be made accessible to the participants, and so you can read them at your leisure and then email me in the future if you have questions or would like to engage further on any of the points that I bring up. Um, so next slide, please. So it just happened that this pandemic hit right around the same time that we at the World Bank uh, were preparing a new policy briefing on tertiary education. And so we've held off on the distribution of this note as I, you know, everybody's research has been impacted, including ours. Um, so I framed this presentation a bit on what we were thinking prior to the pandemic, since many of these things I believe will still uh, be relevant in the future. Um, but we need to take special note of the challenges that are coming, particularly, as Ellen said, with the financial implications of the impending recession, although in many cases the recession is here. It's not even pending. It's on top of us right now. Um, and also what's happening at the institutional level around the world in terms of uh, furloughs, closures, mergers, et cetera. So I'm going to sort of contextualize my presentation and the broader thinking that we had on tertiary education, particularly this focus on systems. And then I have a few slides that are very specific to what I see and what we in the World Bank are discussing as the medium and long term. Uh, effects and thoughts to be to be considered around the pandemic. So uh, here we go. We, we are defining tertiary education as Ellen did already as all post secondary education in some countries. This is inclusive of research universities, 
uh, post-secondary TVET, further education. Uh, in my mind, because I was trained in the United States, um, the California Master Plan to me is one of the great models of this integrated uh, system where it takes all post-secondary education and groups it together uh, as an integrated space for students and lifelong learning. Um, some of the defenses that the World Bank is sort of offering as why we care about tertiary education. It is an instrument of long-term growth. It has an extremely high return on investment, particularly in the lowest income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia. So we have regrouped after uh, about a generation of research that didn't support tertiary education to really come behind tertiary education as a sustainable development driver. Um, next slide, please. So what we assessed initially are, are these conflicting global conditions that we have right now. Globalization, multiculturalism is increasingly uh, valued and experienced by people, but at the same time, we're in a nationalistic period as we've seen through elections and policy drivers, particularly in the wealthiest countries, but not isolated there. Uh, millions of people are getting moved out of poverty, but inequalities are persisting that, in ways that we're having a hard time addressing. Advanced skills are being more demanded and low skilled jobs are disappearing, creating real stress on uh, economies around the world and so on. Next slide, please. I know I don't wanna take up too much time. I have a long presentation, I won't do that. So we're talking about um, systems. And so we're looking at stable systems that look at equity, that care about what's happening with the demographic shifts in the, in the countries and in the regions. We're talking a lot about private sector, not just private providers of higher education, but how to be inclusive of the private sector in curricular evolution, in workplace learning, in lifelong learning. Um, we aren't necessarily encouraging more private higher education provision, which I know is a, a concern across the quality assurance space in particular. Um, but in this space now with increased distance and blended learning, the private sector will become increasingly important as they are the ones who are developing the platforms that we're all embracing as we try to adapt to this new world. And then focusing on STEAM, where we add the A for the arts, we are very aware that general education and, and the arts and culture are fundamental to an educated society as well. And we don't wanna put more emphasis on science than we do on the, the humanities any more than uh, the economy can handle. Next slide, please. So this is how we envision the stable foundation of a tertiary education sector. It has data and evidence-based uh, thinking at the basis. It has a vision and a mission at the top and in the middle, a well-defined structure that includes quality assurance, robust governance and efficient and strategic financing. Next slide, please. And so here is where we get to the meat of where we see uh, how we can support our clients best. And it is in a diversified and fully articulated higher education, tertiary education sector, where we recognize the value of all forms of post-secondary training, that there are pathways that link all of them together and that the individual gets to choose the route that they take and are not blocked off at any particular time should they choose to make uh, inroads in some space, leave and come back, that kind of thing. Uh, and then who do we serve? We serve governments, we serve civil society, we serve employers and investors, et cetera. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we care quite a lot about equity. We just published a blog on the World Bank's website about the equity implications of the COVID uh, disturbance to tertiary education and how the, those who were already in the weakest position have been further uh, isolated and separated from their institutions of higher learning and how we have to think more about how to bring them back uh, in a thoughtful and supportive way. But we care about equity at all stages of life. We care about horizontal and vertical equity that you get to access higher education in whatever field you're choosing to study, what, what interests you, not just in the institution type that you access. Uh, and again, multiple pathways. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talk more about technology. I think this is gonna be a driver for all of our conversations. Uh, what can we use technology for to improve access, to increase the relevance of the educational model and to make our delivery more efficient, particularly in the future as we move towards more blended learning. Next slide, please. You can, this is obvious I think to everybody, we want all of these things to benefit both the individual and society. Okay, continue, thank you. 
one more. Okay, so here is where we see impacts coming in, uh, in the post-COVID uh, middle and long term, that we will see reduced funding for higher education from the public side as well as the private side. Individuals and households will have less spending money, will have less fluidity, people have lost their jobs, uh, and when they go back to work, they may be in less well-paid work. Uh, firms and lending and all of the research uh, monies that come in from external third parties, those will likely go down in the short, medium, and potentially long term, I hope not, uh, and other third party funding like foundations. In this case, we expect more money to go towards health and social protection in the short and medium term, uh, taking care of the immediate crisis, and then hopefully pivot back uh, to more education. Some of the permanent effects that we anticipate are the closing of institutions and programs. <laughs> I'm just going to try to wing it and see where we were. Actually, I have it open on my computer if I need to. Nope, keep going forward. For Someone hit paper. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Oh, nope, so back. One, one, back. one back. Almost done, I swear. I'm almost done, but you need to go back one. Thank you very much. Um, we'll see a permanent closure of programs and institutions, and that will actually impact, as we've seen in other countries before the pandemic, closures of uh, classics and language programs and chemistry and things that were deemed to be um, not so applied. I think there's going to be an acceleration of that. We're already seeing that. Uh, but that will result in a permanent loss of those skills and the specific um, learning and um, outcomes of that, that, that uh, academic field. Uh, the permanent movement of more programs to online and remote platforms. I think this is going to be something we'll all be talking about for the next 18 months or so until it's the reality. Um, reduced in terms of mobility in country, we'll see reduced mobility internally, fewer people traveling further to go to school. Uh, dormitories not opening or becoming seen as less safe in the short and medium term. Um, yeah. More pressures on local institutions. Um, and of course, we're all anticipating reduced global mobility and the related um, reduction in income generation there. Uh, from a loss perspective, something that's not getting much traction is the loss of the contributions that these institutions make to the civic space in which they exist. Uh, they are the center for arts, they're the center for culture, they're the center for community uh, learning, meetings, continuing education, all of that has been frozen and we're not sure at what point that will come back for a lot of places. This is particularly important in regional environments where institutions really are the hub of the culture um, and that may be lost for quite, quite some time. Uh, we anticipate problems with uh, equity, especially with under-resourced or underserved communities who will have a harder time returning to their institutions. Uh, in many cases, it was a very difficult journey to get to the institution in the first place. Uh, returning home puts pressure on getting jobs, supporting families, all the things and the architecture and the infrastructure that allowed them to head out to institutions. A lot of that has been broken. And for those most uh, in need of support, they'll have the hardest time coming back. And then the last point, something else we're trying to figure out how to measure better are the socioeconomic impacts on students and the academic staff of this teaching remotely of the loss of community and the space for uh, personal learning. Next slide, please. That's the last one, I promise. And it's a dense one, so I won't read the whole thing. Um, but <laughs> as I said, we expect permanent closures and mergers. Uh, graduate unemployment, already a problem for many of the World Bank's client countries as we defend increased uh, enrollments in tertiary education in an economy that's shrinking. Um, this is going to become a political problem for many of our clients and something that we are uh, ramping up what kind of interventions, including New Deal type interventions. What can the government do to create spaces for internships and learning in the period while they rebuild their economies? Um, continued capacity building challenges, we know that academic staff around the world were not trained to teach in online ways. We're hearing now of global or regional strikes among students, but in countries all around the world who are dissatisfied with their online learning. How can we support them if this is going to be the reality of how they teach in the coming days and months? Um, how can they access greater international resources? What kinds of no cost delivery models? We've seen Coursera and edX and other providers offering free access to international MOOC-based courses uh, to fill the gap while the countries come up with their own systems of intervention. Um, how do we then train and empower um, our academic staff to uh, 
uh, do a better job to be more comfortable in this format and to embrace the technology that thus far has not been widely embraced, uh, especially in developing countries. And the last slide. And I revert back to um, what I am holding very hard onto as we have these dialogues, which is that we need to hold on to some core values in tertiary education while we address this rapid change in how we operate. And it's very easy right now to, uh, to move to this online space and think all of it is about how do we deliver material to the student. But there's so much more to the tertiary education space, including how do we make sure that all students have equitable access to the learning that they've earned? Uh, how are we holding institutions accountable? What kind of academic freedom are we maintaining in the space as we force the different delivery models onto academic staff? Uh, how do we maintain institutional autonomy? And what is the social responsibility that we're able to continue to support and cement through tertiary education? And there I will close. Okay, thank you very much, Roberta. And uh, I think it was a very good complementary overview to what Alan already said about the future of higher education and what comes clear from both of your presentation that basically COVID-19 uh, uh, mainly is accelerating the process of change that already is happening in higher education. Uh, but it was still also very useful to see your overview of uh, short and medium term uh, effects uh, of COVID-19 on higher education. And the last point, of course, uh, keep in mind the values that we are standing for are very important uh, to keep alive in this whole process, because uh, that is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face in higher education, that everybody is rushing to crisis management and forget about those values. Thank you much, very much for that. Um, I now give the floor for the last presentation to Ahmed Rasa to uh, talk about from the South African perspective. Thank you. Well, Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us onto the program, Hiliki, and I want to just uh, uh, appreciate this, time, this moment of being able to kind of share with the global community. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Ellen and uh, Roberta for kind of laying out the kind of global kind of framework, if you like. Uh, I'm going to be focusing very much on South Africa, and uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of interaction or some sort of intersection, if you like, between what I say and what they say. Uh, and I just want to begin by saying that, uh, uh, that you know, uh, the South African higher education system throughout its history has never faced this kind of crisis. So we're all very kind of uh, uh, struggling with this unprecedented kind of uh, unprecedented moment, if you like, in, in our history. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I just thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, just background to the pandemic here because it's so different from the rest of the world. I don't mean just South Africa, but the whole of the African continent. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we had our first case, the first uh, identified positive case just in, on the 5th of March. Uh, uh, it was a person that arrived back from Italy. Uh, but by the 15th of March, there was this announcement of a state of national disaster, the first time in the history of the country. Uh, of, of the post-1994 period, if you like. Uh, and then uh, within a week after that, uh, schools, universities, and so on went into early recess and closure. And, uh, you know, uh, although the numbers at the time of infected people were very, very small, but the idea of the lockdown that came on the 27th of March was really to try and flatten the, 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 the phrase, you know, flatten the curve uh, on the basis that, uh, you know, our health system would just simply not have coped with the massive with a massive uh, growth in, in 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 individuals needing hospitalization and so on uh, the first death occurred around about the 27th on the same day of the lockdown uh, and the lockdown continued uh, from the 27th of march to the 30th of april about five weeks altogether uh, we have five levels of kind of seriousness of the pandemic and so we moved from level five to level four last friday which means that about 25% of the economy has now reopened. And of course, the big challenge for us is that we are nowhere near the peak of the, of the pandemic. In fact, the pandemic is still growing, but what did happen during the lockdown was a very genuine and, uh, and uh, conspicuous change in the direction of the curve, if you like, of the, of the number of new cases per day. And uh, we saw a direct kind of correlation between the announcement of the lockdown and the change in the curve. Uh, so uh, 
And now, of course, uh, for the last four or five days, uh, there's more traffic on the roads and so on, but there's also a significant amount of attention being paid to social distancing, the, using, the use of masks and so on. Uh, and as at the 30th of April, uh, well, I, I should say even today, I could tell you that there are now 7,000 cases uh, and about 130 deaths, uh, and the doubling rate is uh, between 12 and 13 days. It's a really, it was a really severe lockdown, uh, which was an, on an economy that was already a stagnant economy, massive unemployment before the, before the lockdown, grinding poverty, deep inequality. And in fact, the lockdown was a kind of social triage operation going on because there were huge swathes of uh, our cities and so on where uh, kind of uh, where the, you know, the idea of a lockdown was just an imaginary kind of uh, intervention, if you like, it's just impossible to put it in place. And yet uh, there has been a very significant kind of uh, uh, shift in that, uh, in the curve, if you like, uh, during, during that period. Okay, next slide, please. So if one, if one looks at the impact of COVID, the immediate impact of uh, COVID-19 on the higher education sector, uh, what you hear, what you see is uh, just a, a range of short-term financial crises, which are clearly are gonna have lasting impacts. None of the universities in South Africa have any kind of major kind of endowment base from which to draw and so on. But more importantly, it's already been made clear by the government that there isn't going to be any kind of bailout money or anything like that. So universities are really having to deal with a very, very challenging uh, period, which might actually result in a kind of reshaping of the, uh, of the staffing structures and so on. At the moment, the universities are holding on to the staff. I mean, are holding on to the current staffing structures, uh, but that might well change as time goes on. Uh, there are a number of crises. It's not just about the the fact that, for example, you know the, uh, the 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 likelihood of students coming back for the second semester. I, I should have mentioned that our academic year runs from January to December. Uh, the likelihood that students will return for the second semester is uh, of deep concern, whether students will return or not, and of course that will have huge impact on tuition fees, uh, tuition fee income, and so on. Uh, and tuition fee income overall is about uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the income of the universities. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the major priority, of course, is in fact completing the academic year. Uh, unfortunately, we have no idea what the trajectory of the pandemic is going to be. Uh, we, you know, all we know at the moment is that the numbers are growing day by day. Uh, and the, the, the epidemiologists indicate that the peaking might happen sometime in July, August, uh, some are even saying September. Uh, the, the challenge for us will be to understand how to complete the academic year. And I'll come back to that just now because it's uh, all tied in with this issue around uh, kind of remote learning, online learning and so on. Um, we have a disrupted uh, research and graduate studies flow, including funding impacts. And the funding impacts are multiply kind of dimensional because on the one hand, it's uh, about uh, funding from the business sector, but the business sector is in crisis. Funding from the state, the state is in crisis. Uh, you know, we, the, the economy has just been downgraded by the ratings agencies and so on. So that has a huge impact. The RAND, the RAND dollar, the South African currency exchange rate with the, with the dollar and the euro and so on has taken a severe knock. So uh, any imports uh, of uh, journals and uh, lab equipment and lab, uh, all of that will be severely impacted. Uh, international students have largely left. We have about 7% of the students in the system, 7 to 10% of the students in the system are international students. Uh, they have largely left. Uh, and uh, so that's a big concern about when they'll be able to return and so on. Uh, and then finally, it's just uh, understanding that uh, there are huge stresses on both students and staff. And, uh, and, 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 and there are uh, deep concerns about anxiety and mental health issues and so on. Um, so what, we, what we're finding, in, not just in higher education, but in society more generally, is just this intensifying of the inequality kind of fault lines, if you like, just really tearing them apart in a sense. Right? Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then, uh, 
you know, because of the need for a much stronger interaction between university and government and so on, uh, there's also the challenge now of university autonomy are being under threat, uh, the demand that we act as a sector, you know, including the college sector and government and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, th there's very little leeway with regard to that. And the big question will be whether we'll be able to uh, retract, if you like, out of that uh, uh, university autonomy and so on. And that's, of course, uh, always uh, some, a challenge that we have to face. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we learning from COVID-19? The first one is something that we've been grappling with in South Africa, but elsewhere as well, I guess. It's just addressing higher education's relationship with society. And as I indicated, it's a legacy issue, but it's become much more apparent now in the sense that you know, universities are still seen as kind of elite institutions. Uh, they're seen as kind of having privilege over the college sector and so on and so forth. But more importantly, uh, it's all around the issue of what is the relationship between universities and society more generally? And uh, uh, I'll come back to that in a second, because I think that there, it's a multifaceted question. E-learning is difficult and, in fact, even dangerous uh, in a grossly unequal society. Uh, we have uh, terrible ructions, if you like, with regard to e-learning. I would say 50 to 60 percent of students in our system are uh, without devices. They might have smartphones, but no devices. Uh, data is, uh, you know, uh, have access, access to the internet is very limited. Uh, we, we're working on all of this. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that the, um, that the inequalities uh, are both institutional so you have the University of Cape Town which is uh, moving ahead uh, you know with its kind of online learning uh, kind of operations and so on uh, and then it's also intra institutional in the sense that uh, within single institutions you have students who are sort of well endowed and others who are not so it's a, it's an extraordinarily uh, kind of uh, dangerous uh, kind of uh, fault line if you like in uh, in a context like ours um, what has become clear to us is that uh, th th there's, there's always the challenge, but uh, a, there, there ought to be a renewed challenge in producing new cohorts of engaged citizens and intellectuals. Uh, and what we are finding now during this COVID-19 period uh, is, first of all, just how differently the government is managing it compared to the, uh, to the HIV, to the way in which it dealt with the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic. Uh, and in particular, you know, just the kind of the idea that uh, science has to take the center stage, the science and epi epidemiology has to take center stage. Uh, uh, that has been very helpful and has drawn lots and lots of people into kind of the discourses around, uh, around the pandemic. And it seems to me at least that this is a very heartening uh, uh, this time and that it gives us the impetus to really focus in on this role of higher education. Um, there's a growing demand for flexible and lifelong learning, uh, new forms of credentialing, uh, the, uh, you know, and as was pointed out earlier, there's a major kind of growth of interest in the private sector, which are uh, kind of more kind of set up for this kind of learning and so on. Uh, there's a huge impact on efficiency and effect effectiveness, uh, largely because the campuses are all closed and, uh, mm. and all of that. I mean, there's a whole range of issues there that we can talk about. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, there are indications of intense, intensifying corporate interventions, uh, both internal to the sector and external to the sector. Internal to the sector in the sense that some of the universities have already begun to kind of uh, use the capacities they have to enter this terrain, uh, those that can do that. But for the most, for the most, the universities are really, uh, um, really uh, unable to do that. Uh, but clearly, there are also large private sector enterprises both local and global, that are now making uh, interventions into this arena. Um, of course, the other thing that we learn is the, that we are really seeing the impact of chronic underfunding over the last 20 years, uh, that at a time when we are in a serious crisis, the ability of the universities to really you know, set aside the six-month uh, kind of six kitty to manage the process is just not there. Uh, and secondly, um, it's just how fragile uh, the, our universities are. Even the most developed universities are extraordinarily fragile. And uh, that's, that's a lesson for us, I think, here. Yeah. 
the next slide, please. So I just want to just to just as I get to my last slide, I thought that what we would do is just look at, you know, what we saw around us before COVID-19. Uh, the one is just clearly the idea of all the large global challenges, the, glo you know, climate change, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, human migrations, the rise of political violence, uh, increasing poverty and uh, in many parts of the world and inequality and so on. Uh, and uh, that, you know, we have to understand that universities have a role in all of these. So I'm just going to run through them very quickly. Uh, they are intensive intense local challenges uh, around uh, poverty and inequality and so on. Uh, there's an erosion of democracy and a slide towards anti-intellectualism. Uh, we've been very pleasantly surprised at the way the South African government has taken on this challenge and how closely it's working with science and so on. But still, we are very concerned about the erosion of democracy uh, and the slide towards anti-intellectualism, not just in South Africa, but globally as well. Um, of course, uh, as was pointed out earlier, there are rapid changes in the world of work uh, due largely to this new technology moment that we are in. Uh, and there are large shifts in the geo geopolitics of knowledge. Right? And uh, South Africa is uh, very much kind of integrated into that global knowledge system. About 57% of our research output is uh, in collaboration with uh, individuals from other parts of the world. So we are very sensitive to these large shifts that are taking place in the geopolitics of knowledge. Um, and then uh, what we are seeing, of course, uh, both internally and externally to the system is this corporatization and marketization of higher education, uh, partly, not partly, but very significantly response to globalization. Uh, and that, of course, has uh, weakened the university's uh, connections with their local contexts and so on. And, uh, and there are large, as I mentioned previously, I mentioned this already, there are large shifts in the geopolitics of knowledge. And then... Uh, although in South Africa at the moment there's still a very high demand for higher education, it's still a very good deal for young people to get a high, a qualif a high education qualification uh, because of the high unemployment rates in South Africa. Uh, graduates, uh, the unemployment rate of graduates is very low, uh, so this is still a very good deal. But we, will, we are, I think, going to see a growing demand for different forms of, uh, of, uh, of, of credential, uh, credentialing and so on. Uh, as we head into the future. So I just wanted to make the point that, you know, COVID-19 has the potential to be both the accelerator of some of these and the decelerator of others. And, uh, and that's something that we need to take into account as we think about the future. Next slide, please. And can you then summarize it up? Uh, I'm yes, I'm uh, almost done. Hmm. So these are the shaping questions as we navigate the next six months. and. Uh, the first one is just this idea of what is the purpose of universities as social institutions, uh, shaping and how do we shape new relationships with our publics? Uh, and the, you know, maybe in question time I can get back to this a little bit. And I think a part of this really is about reimagining the public good role of universities as knowledge-intensive institutions, uh, and in particular focusing on the latter part, saying, you know, what is the role of knowledge-intensive institutions uh, in in a society like ours? Uh, and then uh, just unifying knowledge across the disciplinary domains. Uh, I think what's becoming more and more clear to us is that every time we hit a crisis, we tend to kind of look at things in compartmentalized fashions. And uh, I think the president's advisory committee now has 43 members on it. Half of them are epidemiologists. Uh, there are no social scientists on it uh, per se. Right? So, you know, just a big question there, that kind of thing. Uh, but also reimagining the theory, praxis, nexus. And these are things that... We, we have been talking about for a long time, but I think we are now seeing as uh, being really important. Um, we're seeing an accelerated unbundling and its implications for quality, and we have to worry about the uh, implications for quality, institutional form, and so on. And this unbundling, by the way, is, I think is going to be accelerated by COVID-19 as we head into the future and as universities grapple with the, uh, with the financial crisis that we face. And then it's just uh, capturing and problematizing the new technology moment and uh, trying to understand, you know, uh, how to be, how to use it for public good, and how to ensure that we're not sucked into a new, into a new kind of uh, uh, kind of a global kind of paradigm, uh, but rather to see how we can uh, use this as a uh, as, as 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 furthering 
uh, the purposes of building a better society. And then I think one of the most important things that's going to, that has come out of COVID-19 is the, uh, that hopefully that this will be an acceleration towards open science and towards the construction of multiple global commons, notwithstanding the challenges we have from uh, the US and elsewhere. But this really does seem to me to be a major challenge, this idea of opening, of, of, of establishing open science protocols and, and constructing sort of new global column commons. It seems to me that uh, the decisions that we make over the next few months are really going to shape the way in which higher education <laughs> unfolds uh, heading into the future. And from the South African point of view, it seems to me that and our universities are all focusing on this, is how do we shape uh, kind of a future of the universities uh, using a kind of social justice rubric um, in, in, instead of just simply kind of saying, how do we survive uh, into the future, but rather shaping, using this as an opportunity to shape uh, um, uh, uh, shape a future that is based on a social justice rubric. Yeah. Uh, with that, I'll say thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for this uh, perspective uh, from uh, South Africa and the African context, which I think is uh, very important because there's always a tendency in higher education discussions to look at far much more from the uh, developed world and not looking into what are the implications which are very strong and but also the opportunities uh, we can learn from um, countries like South Africa and other African countries, particularly the emphasis on the, the challenge of inequ increased inequality, uh, the threat of autonomy, uh, the underfunding and fragile situation and the challenges with e-learning are I think points that you have been addressing uh, at the same time like Robert and others claiming that uh, social justice, values, etc., are very important to keep in mind in this time of, of crisis. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, we have received several questions, but I first want to be uh, time. And Joshua, if you can indicate me how much time we can over, pass over the hour uh, to this, to take time enough to for questions and answers. But before giving the floor back to Hilligje to moderate the question answers, which are done. Can the three pa panelists in particular uh, briefly comment on each other but in, and maybe already taking into some time to responding to some of the questions they find in particularly important and they have seen on the chat. So maybe Alan, can you very briefly uh, provide feedback on the two other presentations and, uh, and questions that you have seen? Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I thought this was really interesting. We all kind of covered a lot of ground and crisscrossed um, across them. Um, certainly the issue of um, stability and or sustainability, it seems to me is a big issue, but sustainability isn't just kind of staying as one is. It's also going to be what I suggested is going to be mainstreaming change. And the question is how? So, I mean, one of the issues I'd be thinking about is I mentioned rethinking tertiary education. I do think picking up on Ahmed's point, there is an issue of reshaping. And um, this is also speaks to the issue around equity. It speaks about regional diversity, but also regional disadvantages, which I mean within country regional disadvantages, um, not just between, but within and finance. And one of the ways it seems to me that we're going to need to look at this is to focus much more on collaboration between institutions. Um, it speaks to the issue that Gulam raised in his chat about have we looked at the education pipeline? And this is where we start looking at this ecosystem, these learning ecosystems. Um, we talk a lot about economic ecosystems. So I kind of like the way of looking at that as a much more collective approach one to looking at an educational approach and looking at how different um, institutions um, fit together. Because I think otherwise we're, we have a danger of, um, I mentioned the question of, is it just that the survival of the fittest, those institutions that can survive will survive. And if we go down that road, given the kinds of huge institutions Sorry, that ended up being a phone call. Um, so, so we end up in a, in a situation in which the institutions that cater for 
weaker regions, um, people of more disadvantaged and so on will actually turn out uh, more disadvantaged at the end of it, increasing stratification. And this is where I think the focus on a system vision that um, Roberta pointed out in the World Bank approach in terms of how is the system overall going to respond? What are those, those issues? I think that's, um, that's important. That's just an immediate reaction on there. Just one other comment to make. There's a lot of really interesting things that came out, so I'm speaking fast. Is um, quality, it seems, again, Gulam raised the question of quality. I think quality is going to be a big differentiator, um, not just in terms of what we're providing and the, and the quality assurance systems, but also a comment that was made, the, the transition between emergency online to real online. And some people think that we're there because everyone's sitting in front of Zoom. That's not quality online. And um, this is um, a real challenge for the system overall. It's a challenge for the academics. It's a challenge for the students. And again, elite, elite institutions will be okay. People will, will pay. They will be able to pay. They, they broadly recruit high socioeconomic students with a lot of human um, social capital. I'm not interested in the top 1% of the population. It's everyone else. And this is really an issue of the quality overall of what we're providing. Thank you. Roberta? Thanks. Um, yeah, fantastic presentations from my colleagues. And I have a couple of takeaways. First, I want to address to the question of quality. And maybe um, the challenge for us as we were thinking about the responses is that in my heart of hearts, quality is the foundation of all that we're doing. And what we're addressing right now in terms of quality is, is the immediate. How do we assess students properly? How do we get faculty ready today to be able to deliver enough of what they can to give the students the education they need and deserve and signed up for just to wrap up the term that they're in right now. That's an immediate challenge that we have. What can we do to ensure some baseline quality today? And then the next phase is, can we uptrain the faculty we have? Do we have to replace some of them with trained faculty for different modes of learning? Are we providing the right pedagogical underpinnings for our academic staff to deliver in the new mode of tertiary education in the future. That is a quality issue that every institution is going to have to assess and that every system is going to have to assess, which then changes how our quality assurance agencies will operate. Do they have the, the capacity in their current structures today to then assess quality distance and blended learning at a traditional institution? Um, they have done a mixed job, I think, addressing quality in distance learning in a lot of ways. Uh, UNESCO has been leading a lot of this dialogue around how do we recognize degree mobility and uh, course mobility cross-border high, higher education. But I think the quality questions of whether we can um, assess and determine the validity of education delivered through online and blended means is a big question. And if, whether we have enough people who can actually... Yeah. Uh, develop that policy and develop those frameworks, that's a big challenge coming in the future. Um, some of the things that I was thinking to uh, the research question, which we didn't really get into here, but uh, anyone who's sort of studied what happened with research in the immediate aftermath of these closing, you know, research is actually being pushed way back right now with the uh, having to actually literally close down labs, euthanize animals, destroy um, samples and you know impact human and other subjects right in their longitudinal work so I mean research is going to be a major problem to get back on track uh, whether the funding comes back whether they can restock their spaces this is a, a huge issue for the research institutions around the world and including those even in our poorest lowest income countries where they were trying to drive some really applied localized research that has had a dramatic impact uh, this this crisis has had on them. I'll stop right there so I can hand it over to Ahmed. Okay, yeah, Ahmed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hans, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, uh, Ellen, um, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, that um, uh, first of all, I mean, it's, it's it's clear to me that there there is a need 
for a for an international kind of conversation about these things because is i think you know even though systems are very different and sh- sh- uh, and and shaped in different ways and so on i think that the idea of an international conversation would be really important as we head into this you know as we begin to address these shaping questions it seems to me uh, just simply because i think that uh, you know the, the future after covid-19 has to be much more intensely local and global simultaneously i know that's a that's almost a kind of a cliche but i think it's uh, critically important that for universities to 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 maintain or to to reestablish their uh, their their reputations with their publics and so on they have to be locally connected but, uh, but it's clear from covid-19 uh, that uh, and the climate change and so on that we have to start working in international ways uh, and i think that the the project that roberta just mentioned the unesco project around uh, harmonizing qualifications and so on uh, that's one really good example of how we can take uh, these processes forward it seems to me uh, there were two questions i i picked up which i thought were interesting the one was uh, mariki one uh, mariki valas i guess uh, she says you know will crisis will the crisis improve the trust in science uh, i think that you know clearly uh, science has uh, you know has really come to the fore to some extent and is 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 very much to the fore uh, in this crisis but i don't think it's enough you know uh, i think that there's still a huge amount of work for universities and other knowledge intensive institutions to do in reimagining their relationships with their publics i mean i think that uh, you know clearly this is an important one and i have to say in south africa there's been an explosion of activity in our universities in support of the struggle against this pandemic uh but i don't think that that's enough i think that it's really is about reimagining higher education uh and and its connection with its public i know that sounds a bit uh, esoteric but i think that we have to do that uh the second question was the issue of access and uh, uh, i can't remember who raised that i think it was doria who raised that and uh, and i think yeah you know again it depends so much on where we are you know uh, you know we have a 20% participation rate in south africa uh 21% participation rate in south africa of 18 to 24 year olds uh that's nowhere near enough you know uh, and in particular of course in an unequal society that has uh, you know that is shaped in a particular way uh, uh so so if you if at the very basis uh, at the very basic level you think of a a, a social justice role as, as kind of a social mobility role uh for universities uh then uh, we have to increase the participation rate and get more and more young people from uh working class families uh, into the universities uh <laughs> so uh, so just to say that i think that we have to continue working at access but we have to do that in the context that we are assuring uh a success that we are also working uh on success i mean i think that uh, it's not enough for us and i think uh, roberta kind of mentioned you know our our staff kind of properly tuned uh attuned to teaching in new fashions and so on and nowhere can we see no way can we say that so uh, so it seems to me that uh, it's not enough to just work on access that you have to work seriously on success as well thank you but maybe on on the access question also uh, alan and uh, roberta gulam mohammed bai says uh, what about a pipeline from uh, k12 of education i mean we see on the short term of course of course a loss of uh, quality there in particular for people uh, for children who don't have access to online education they were losing a whole uh, period of of teaching but also given the unemployment the financial crisis etc for children to have a uh, good quality education and the impact that that has on higher education and access uh, can some of you say something about that Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll go first. It's fine. Um, you go first. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think higher education in a good day, in a good economy, has actually spent a lot of time developing remediation interventions, right? So there is a space at a lot of institutions, especially in a well-structured system, where they can bring students who have shown the qualifications, even if not the best training. And that's what we're going to get now. We're going to get students who are obviously a uh, well-skilled intelligent all of the things that a, a teacher assessment can 
uh, tell us about a student's preparation for higher education. If they then are admitted to an institution, then an intervention needs to take place. And it can happen through many points of contact, through Summer Bridge, through extra uh, learning labs, things like this, things that actually we support in a lot of our projects because we do recognize even in a good day that there are weaknesses in the pipeline and that students who may fall out may fall out for reasons that have nothing to do with capacity, but they have to do with uh, access to an education environment that could nurture them in the same way that a wealthy student could have or a well-resourced student could have. So the pipeline question there is one that can be addressed. Now, now the challenge that we're going to face now is that there's gonna be a lot of students who will choose not to attend traditional institutions in the autumn because of the uncertainty about the mode of delivery. Who would choose to attend a blended learning forum or entirely online institution that is normally bricks and mortar if they could do it elsewhere or cheaper if they go to a different institution? That's gonna put pressure on the class a year from now, which is then going to create a whole different pipeline question, which is how do you then fill your limited number of spaces with two years of students potentially or something like that. So there's a lot of pipeline concerns that are coming down. Thank you. Ellen, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems to me this opens up an opportunity for higher education to work more closely with secondary and with further further education and to um, work on that issue of the, of, quote, the pipeline and the collaboration. I go back to my ecosystem because we, in general, have a problem with each um, level of education blaming the previous one for problems with students. Either the, the secondary often blames a primary, the higher education blames the secondary in terms of students being unprepared, even in a good day. Um, and what we really need to be looking at is much greater uh, interaction between them. And it seems to me this gives an opportunity for that. We're all going to be struggling with um, with resources. And what ways can we look at, and this is the emphasis on efficiency and effectiveness, but in a way that's, that's mutually beneficial. Are there ways I've seen um, joined up campuses where we've got joined up um, sharing of facilities, back office, gym facilities, other kinds of, of learning opportunities and I think this is an opportunity, in fact, for higher education to show its public good face in a way that it may not be um, a place where it has gone before, but I think it's really quite important. Thank you. Uh, before going, uh, uh, handing over to Hilla here, uh, one other question. Uh, you, you all talked about the importance of quality, but there were some questions saying, well, what about academic standards? Are academic standards not in danger? when underfunding is happening, when there is all those challenges that we, you have been addressing, and also doesn't it have an impact on the contracts of academics uh, that uh, we already have seen before the crisis, a trend that tenureship was under challenge and that uh, contracts were much be shorter. Will that not increase even more? And by that, quality of uh, higher education uh, and standards that we need to have are going to be even more in danger. And, uh, um, do some of you want to uh, react to those questions? Uh, okay, I'll say something. Yeah. Let's jump in on it. Um, quality is always an issue. Um, it's a collective concern on the part of everyone, you know, all stakeholders in it. Um, finance is part of it, but it's not the only answer to, to quality. And um, this is clearly a really, really big issue affecting higher education, but finance is always an ongoing issue um, that we have. There isn't probably one agenda that we don't, one meeting we don't discuss somewhere along the line money. And clearly finance is always relative, depending on where you sit in the spectrum, developed, you know, developing elite mass, wherever you are in the system, finance is always it. But so we need to look at how we maintain quality with the resources we have and what that means about how we might change or adjust our, our way of teaching and the way in which we um, develop programs. But I don't think there's gonna be a magic wand that's gonna say, here's a whole lot of money we just got and decided to give you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Uh, I'll just come in really quick on the academic standard question, which is, you know, that, that's a very, um, it's a very diverse space right now on academic standards globally anyway. And I know some of the chats have been about this as well. I mean, in many of the countries where I'm working, um, you, you know, most of the academic staff are teaching with only a first degree. Most of them are, are uh, you know, really a term or two ahead of the students that they're teaching. This is actually very normal in a lot of the lowest income countries. Um, academic standards are not the same globally. And the impact of this may or may not accelerate that. In, in many of the countries, this is not going to accelerate a problem. The problem is already so bad that this is more of a question, as Ellen was saying, is of can we even finance what we have and hold it stable long enough that we let the economies and the, the global space come up underneath it so the bottom hasn't fallen out. And, and in large measure, we're trying to do, do that. We're trying to stop the bottom from falling out. It's not yeah. the most optimistic perspective, but it is the realistic perspective. And you know, where the World Bank comes in, and some people ask this question about, you know, how are we supporting higher education? I could speak uh, an entire, you know, a term uh, semester course on how the World Bank is supporting higher education. But in, in this instance, in the crisis, it really is to try to stop the, the least um, resourced among us from losing what they have. Okay, yeah, Hans, like yeah, just a very quick point, and that is that I, I think that as the crunch, you know, as the financial crunch begins to settle in, uh, I think what you're going to see in South Africa and elsewhere is just an increased unbundling, you know, uh, kind of outsourcing of teaching and so on. And uh, I think that that's going to have serious consequences for the for the management of quality. I mean, I uh, you know already you know uh, we're seeing this uh, to some extent uh, in, in some of our universities, but uh, uh, this can only accelerate in the next period of time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Hilla here to moderate uh, the next part, which we still have something like 15, 20 minutes to answer questions. So I'm leaving and Hilla here joins in. Thank you all. Thanks. Sir. Hello. <laughs> so I challenge anyone to pronounce my name as well as Hans does. <laughs> But that is a different issue of interculturality. I would like to thank the speakers for the excellent presentations uh, that you made and for fueling the discussion uh, in the way you did. And, um, it's, uh, it's a pity that some of the recording uh, was a bit difficult or that you could not speak as you wished, but we will edit the recording and make sure that it is available to all, including your PowerPoint presentations. And somebody also asked if we could um and do something about the chat and we will try and see if we can also capture uh, that there you've been excellent as speakers to also pick up on the questions that were asked already uh, so the uh, Marijke Whaler's question on do you think the crisis will enhance trust in science and universities in the long term was one that you picked on, um, Ahmed, but which was balanced by another question by Alexander Aramovic, who asked, do you expect a deterioration of the academic status and the impact uh, overall on university governance that that will ask? But I think you also touched on that a little. So I will pick on a few questions. And if you want to to pick on that again in, in your responses, it would be very good. There is a, a basic question that came up, and that is an interesting one, because we frame our series in terms of short, medium, and long term. And um, uh, Alex Rev asked, but what, what are we talking about? What is the period we believe we're talking about? And it's a very difficult um, uh, question, because do we know what the short, medium, or long term will be? And, and when will we see um, a time when we will be able to analyze the effects of COVID-19 and take the decisions for the future that are needed? So that is a, a big question to, this, to all three of you as well. Um, so the, the, the other big topic that came up is the issue of quality. And um, you coined it Gulam, and it was picked up by others as well. And what it also led to question uh, was how to actually develop the kind of standards for online education. And Nadia Gmelj uh, explained the, um, in, in her, her chat comments that very big difference between the emergency uh, online teaching and real 
online learning experience and you all touched on it in different ways but i think it's important to get back to it because much of the questions did um, um, concern that very important topic how if uh, governments decide to cut on funding will they go massively towards uh, promoting online teaching saying that that will be the answer to the future um, that was one of the underlining questions that also came through your presentations. And then, if so, what does that mean? Ahmed Bawa, you said that the corporate sector was coming in very heavily with, with providing support and taking over. Uh, is that the answer? And then how can we make sure that the quality and the academic quality there is guaranteed as well? Um, and the other question that is linked to this, who defines the content of the online teaching and how to ensure that the online teaching material um, beyond even the, the um, assistance to the, to the teaching uh, staff uh, with the adequate um, um, uh, ways to teach them into online learning, where is the material coming from and are we not at risk of um, generalizing uh, access to online um, material from one part of the world and not the rest of the world and how to address that. I think that is a big part of the, the questions as well. I will stop here, but then there are other questions that were in the chat box. So maybe I give the floor to you. Maybe, Ellen, you want to start? Okay. Okay. Um I think one of the questions you, you mentioned, Hillard, was the issue of um, when do we need to take actions and thinking about the future and so on. And um, I'd say now. I mean, some idea that there is going to be, I mean, again, even on the health side, um, the advice certainly, I'm in Ireland, we're still in lockdown and we have five phases, but there are certainly clear that life is not going to all of a sudden one day return to what it was. People talk about a new normal. And um, as, I, as I said at the end of my talk, some things stick and some things won't stick. Adaptability is the key issue. And um, if you're in a, I was a vice president for 20 years at my university, and I would say you need to start thinking now. What are those kinds of changes that you need to adapt and how will you adapt? And what are the kinds of ways? And that also has to do with the teaching and the online. So to what extent does this alter your, let your, your portfolio provision? To what, uh, to what extent does it change the focus? Can you continue to do everything you are doing? To what extent are you going to be looking at blended learning? Indeed, in some cases, you know, the, the question of the quality is certainly key. So what kinds of preparations are you making in terms of the upskilling of your own staff, whether they're part-time um, or they're full-time staff in terms of meeting these? And there are lots of, of changes that are coming down the road. I don't think there's any... Um, box of answers, but they are, each institution I think is going to need to look at it. That's why I keep coming back to my issue of collaboration. That to me is one of the key issues is how institutions collaborate, not least because it's not possible to be excellent in everything you do, but it's about sharing and developing and, and so on. And I think um, collaboration is key. Um, I might then just to refer to the point that Ahmed raised and maybe to make a bit of a plug. Um, I think this is the time for um, increasing international, what I would call multilateralism in higher education. I wrote a piece about this. It's in the University World News this week, maybe a bit controversial, but I don't think, I think we do have lots of activity but we don't have any structured engagement on an ongoing basis. And that seems to me to be a big hole in the higher education research arena. Yeah, thank you. Ahmed or Roberta, would you like to react also to the questions? 
احنا كنا ثانك يو ثانك يو سو ماتش يا لوك اي اي دونت ثينك ذات ذا لوك ليت مي تيك ا ستيب باك اي مين اي ثينك ذات ذا ذات ذا كايند اوف ذا ذا تراديشنال انديرستاندينغ اوف ذا رول اوف يونيفرستيز ان سوسايتي هاز Uh, has been in you know under question for a while now and i and i think that you know and i, I think what covid-19 is going to do is uh, force us to accelerate that uh, that thinking exactly. uh, you know just a little kind of uh, uh, just a, a little side story you know, in 20 between 20 around about 2016 uh, in october i was sitting in my office and uh, the phone was ringing incessantly Uh, because the discussion was whether the system should be shut down for a period of time because of student uh, ac- student actions uh, yeah. now the whole system was about to go into closure there wasn't a single defense of the university system from anybody except from within the universities themselves uh, <laughs> so sh- it was a shocking realization you know that yeah. the universities yeah. have really been alienated uh, and have really alienated yeah. uh, their publics yeah. So uh, so just a clear indication that uh, we have to use this covid-19 this juncture if you like as an opportunity to really reshape our thinking uh, around the relationship between universities and their publics and I, it's not just the local publics i think we have to be careful that we're also talking about the global publics uh, that and uh, you know it, it fits in with what, what ellen just said just now and and i think that um, yeah just on uh, one of the other issues was uh, that was raised was the issue around um i think that uh i think that the short term sustainability i mean the short term crisis financial crisis uh the way that that is managed both by universities and governments is really going to shape the way in which universities uh come out of this period i, th- I think that we we really do face uh, 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 a very serious kind of uh, i'm going to call it a kind of a, a disjuncture again i mean that uh, universities were kind of going along at a at a certain kind of pace and suddenly you know uh, there's a crisis and this, without any warning you realize just how fragile those universities are uh, even even the most kind of established universities uh, uh, so it it really is about saying that uh, we have to think about this current the current immediate crisis in very serious in a very serious way if we are to come out of it in a way that will allow us to build again um, otherwise i think we're going to be seeing a, a devastation and in particular universities are going to have to take steps like uh, you know like uh, letting staff go and so on uh, and that's going to have huge long term implications about the nature of collegiality and everything else at our universities Yes. Oh, no. just, yeah. Just one I think uh, one... I think you raised one point very strongly and this this is this um on the one hand universities are called to assist with research or to assist in many different ways but very often unfortunately it's only one side of the university that is called to the task and not the entire university also the social sciences humanities that that are part of the solution and you talked about anti intellectualism and that is uh, something that we have to definitely also address uh, very strongly and it's part of that other uh, issue that you're you're addressing there uh, where we have to build this trust and it's not, it should not only be only be the system defending the system from inside but definitely find ways to get through to the policy policymakers and to society that society sees the need for higher education because there was one other question and then i also turn to you roberta but um some one of the the uh, participants um asked um and then let me find who that was so that i give back to the person um i think it was um ah i am sorry i don't remember who it was doesn't matter it was an important question about well today if if we are to to transform the universities will the future uh, is the issue of access an important one today um is should we not um, uh, work more on strengthening the systems as they are and is the issue of access today an important one 
from the side of IAU, I could give a straight yes. It is essential to also address the issues of uh, quality inequalities. But please um, uh, take that one up as well in, in your responses. I know we're already at 3.30. I hope we still have a few minutes. I see some people drop off because time is off. I hope you still have some 10 minutes to give us to this webinar um, here. OK, I'm going to answer quickly and then I'll pass. So I'm going to go back to the first question, um, which was about what do we mean by short, medium and long term um, inside the bank? As we are talking about this, we are looking at the reaction time, the recovery time and the time of resilience. So that's really how we're structuring our thoughts on this. It's not time bound. It's more action bound uh, and response bound. Uh, we are coming to the close of the reaction period, people, have, institutions and systems have done what they were going to do in reaction to COVID. Now we're in the recovery time. How do we wrap up what needs to be done? How do we prepare for what's coming? That's what Ellen was discussing as well. And then hopefully all of that leads to resilient institutions and systems that can weather a storm like this. And it's obviously we don't expect pandemic again, but we do know we have other issues like civil unrest and war and weather conditions and other things that can shut an institution down for a month or more. Um, and we, if nothing else, we saw that our systems were not prepared for a shock like that in anywhere in the world. And so hopefully what we're doing now is learning. Uh, I had a note here that you know there's a lot of stock taking that could be done right now in this period where institutions are not doing a lot of other things, but just trying to trying to deliver learning. Um, but they could look at things like, are they offering the right academic programs? Are they are their faculty prepared? How do they get that ready? They have time to prepare that now. There's a lot of staff who are really anxious to be part of the solution for their institutions and their systems. And then my last point on the earlier question was that this is a time too to focus on mission. What is the mission of your institution? How is it different? How is it purposeful? And can you distill what you're doing down to really reinforce your mission, that institutional mission? Institutions are different. They do different things for different reasons. We bucket them as a single space, a lot of the time for policy making or for political purposes, but institutions that can really promote their, their mission and why they're different and why they're valuable and how they serve will be better off in the long run. And then my la the last question about access, um, I would never under any circumstance say that access should ever fall behind something else. And I'll say this because access when not measured and managed properly means that those with the um, resources and the privilege will always get more. And if we stop caring about access, we just expand the inequities in society and all that that underpins, which is instability at the social, political and economic level. So it, it, we can take it from any point you want, but if we don't focus on equity, we'll never have stable societies, we'll never have robust systems. Uh, so I would never stop focusing on access. Yeah, man, I, I fully agree on that one. Uh, but but um, as for the IAU, that is what we work uh, on as well. But you had another very uh, strong point there on uh, the importance to hold on to the core values of equitable access, accountability, academic freedom, institutional autonomy, and social responsibility. And these are core to everything that we should uh, develop even more strongly so into the future. My question to all three of you is, are we um, up to doing that? Can we? Um, and, and is there space for that in the, in the, in the current situation? Um, I, I know that, that you will have a mixed mixed response, but I think that it's um, it's about time as well. Next to that important point that you made, um, uh, Ellen, uh, that we need for more internationalization and, and uh, valorization of multilateralism. We need the valorization for this and for all the disciplines to be strongly involved in in. Uh, uh, developing the solutions that we need for today and for tomorrow. But maybe you can pick that one up on how do you see that we could collectively make sure that these core values are not shoved under any carpet or behind walls? Well, that's always an issue in time in times of trouble, but they are core to, to higher education. They're core to society as a whole in the same way that um, that Roberta has talked about, um, about access and equity, and Agben has talked about um, trust and and the and being close to society. And sometimes 
those issues get lost, um, this is a good time to relook. Um, I think in many cases, if I was to say that some of those issues have gotten lost in a, in a rush to, um, for reputation and rank, where institutions have abandoned their communities and abandoned the, where, they, where they're based and hosted. Um, and so this is an important time to look at it. I look at these core issues as defining where higher education is at. You know, again, I, I agree with Hackman with that issue of this issue of trust in higher education and its publics has been under contention or been there's been a tension around it for quite a while. Some of it has to do with um, perceived elitism. Some of it has to do with um, issues around the quality of graduates, employability, issues around whether or not um, universities have um, turned their back on their local communities in pursuit of global fame and fortune. Um, some of it has to do about, about um, accelerating particular um, or narrowing entry in order to meet certain outcomes to those who are more um, privileged and hence you have better outcomes and so on. So this is a big issue. Um, and I'm not completely convinced that the rush to a science, it necessarily shows that those trust issues are now by the wayside. I don't think that for a moment, I think there's a momentary issue around um, science and that's good, but it's also a narrow definition of yeah. science yeah. and using science um, as a discipline as opposed to knowledge. So using it in that sense, we've seen very little engagement with other disciplines, very little discussion about all these issues. Questions about funding will become narrow um, because of the, there just won't be a, that kind of money around. And how do we decide and look at the breadth of how we look at research and um, all these other issues? So I think there are huge challenges, but I also think there's an importance that when higher education responds, it does so um, part of um, what I would say trying to rebuild the social contract. And it does so in partnership with other um, with other um, societal partners, be that business, civic community, and with government at varying levels, um, lest it be seen as a voice crying for self-interest. And looking, um, I think that's been a problem. Higher education is very good at pursuing its own interests, which aren't always in the public interest. Yeah. Thank you. Ahmed, would you like to pick up on that? No, you're muted. Your mic is not on. Uh, clearly, we're going to have a fairly major kind of impetus here for kind of uh, online e-learning and so on and so forth, you know, during this period of time. Uh, and uh, and th that's good. I mean, it'll help, it'll help us to sharpen our thinking about that kind of uh, that kind of teaching and so on. But I think we have to be really careful that we don't slip into another kind of into another reverie, if you like, you know, yeah. uh, the, 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 the whole issue around face to face learning is still going to be a kind of critical kind of uh, enterprise. And, and the reason I say this is because it's not just because of the, you know, the enormous value of uh, university education for young people and so on, but also because uh, you know, in South Africa, 25 years after 1994, after our change came, we are still in the process of nation building, you know, and the universities are central to that, you know. Uh, at the same time, I mean, at the time when the rest of the world is receding into kind of narrow nationalisms, uh, now is the time for universities to really, uh, to really kind of engage, you know, uh, at that international level, if you like, uh, bringing people together and being the bridges uh, between societies and uh, understanding the importance of building uh, kind of new global commons and so on. So just this idea that actually, you know, producing, uh, producing young intellectuals who are, uh, who are globally connected, who are kind of working across boundary borders, uh, that this is uh, of critical importance for the future of humankind, if you like. So it's really about saying that uh, I think we have to be careful not to 
uh, in the you know in this in this time of great ex exigency uh, that we should not uh, just simply give up all the great things that universities do if you like uh, and, uh, and and slide into a new kind of mode uh, uh, coming out of this crisis yep. but but that does require in my view at least it does require us to sit back and uh, as as a global community of uh, university people to talk about the relationship of universities and society Thank Very you. good, yes. We have five minutes left, I would say, um, and I thank you for taking the extra 15 minutes. Uh, Roberta, would you like to react to this? Um, and, I, and, and, and if I can put oh, ahead, plug in just one last question that was a bit different in nature, yet related to the rest. And Shingo Ashizawa, uh, Ashizama uh, did mention it, and it's, it's a, an interesting one because it's linked to this last point that Ahmed was also making. He said, do you feel the world of work will appreciate micro-credentials and partial studies due to COVID-19? And can higher education adapt to it? And does higher education want to adapt to it? What does this mean today? Uh, so maybe you can take that in just a little in, in your reflections here. So, and actually, I think I can do this sort of in one go, because I think higher education and church education systems and leaders have done quite an abysmal job at owning the messaging about what they do and why it's valuable. And we end up coming underneath all the time trying to defend what we do. It's it's reactive and they need to be much more proactive. I think this is the case, this micro-credentialing case, so I'll turn it to that because we are getting a lot of requests from countries in Latin America right now in particular about how can we offer short-term skills-based learning so that students do not need to go through a whole cycle of education and wait for a degree, that they can get some really relevant, immediately job-related learning uh, because they're going to need to accelerate to get back into the work world of work. Um, it just, I think it's very country-specific. It does depend a lot on how much trust there is in this in the education system that they believe that the quality assurance foundations they believe that the qualification frameworks are robust enough to deliver something of value in a short amount of time i have said i think everyone here has said that micro credentials are what's coming next uh, and either church education finds a place in the system and in the us and uk and in, in spaces where there are community colleges or post-secondary TVET that's robust enough, you can do that relatively easily. Um, the challenge will be like in sub-Saharan Africa where there's only 4% of the cohort attending higher education in any form right now. How you then keep cutting that piece smaller and smaller around different types of credentials for a labor market that doesn't really exist to absorb anyway, right? There is no private sector or very little. Things like that are going to be very difficult, but in more robust and more advanced spaces, where there's greater trust in the education environment. I think there's lots of room for creativity and innovation. And now is the time because that's what the private sector is doing as well. They're innovating in how they're going to deliver what they're doing. They're innovating and in trying to figure out how to keep their services going. They'll be more open, I think, to an innovative conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, one minute each, Ahmed and uh, Ellen. I will start with Ahmed and then close with Ellen. And then, unfortunately, there's more, <laughs> more to be discussed. It will be done in the next session. Ahmed. The, 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 thank you so much. And, uh, if, if, uh, you know, the only thing I'd like to say at this point is that uh, the way we come out of this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic as, as higher education uh, will really shape the way in which we engage, uh, you know, just the, the future of higher education in society. I mean, I think that it's very important during this time uh, not to uh, not to rush into kind of into kind of positions uh, simply because of uh, kind of the what would seem to be very short term priorities. <laughs> I mean uh, that's something I think we have, all have to pay attention to. That uh, we have to keep our eye on the uh, uh, we have to play the long game. We have to kind of keep our eye on you know how we would like the high education system to kind of emerge. Uh, as, as being a vital part of society as we go forward uh, and not just simply slide into short-term decisions that might damage us uh, irrevocably. Uh, and one of them is just simply saying, you know, that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the issue of collegiality is so much a part of the higher education enterprise that we have to be really careful 
during this period not to kind of uh, fracture that kind of uh, you know uh, that kind of, um, uh, of 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 atmosphere at our universities in Swaziland. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, um, I wonder is is this uh, taking taking my international message at a national level? Isn't this the time to ensure that there is a national dialogue on the education and higher education system? This is a societal issue about the importance of higher education and research, and we need to involve everyone in it. It's in many cases, it's not a solution that's resolvable at institutional levels. And I expect, I guess I want to raise that in the sense of, are we looking, I'm just reading off my note here, are we really looking for an educational system, a tertiary system, which empowers a mass knowledge society where progress depends on the wisdom of many? Or are we looking to have one that services only elites? where progress depends on the cutting edge of the knowledge of the chosen few. And this is really quite fundamental because many of these issues are, are going to, they are being accelerated issues that we're, we're already experiencing and they are now at, at the point of um, that we need to have a national conversation around that in each of our countries yeah. as well. Nationally. And multi-stakeholder, probably, as you said, this is not to be it solved is. at the institutional level, but certainly with the different ministries and, and with, with society at large. Um, I'm very yeah. sorry that we're at the end of this webinar, because I think we, we could have gone on with uh, the, the many questions that have been asked and with the issues that you've raised. Um, I would like to very warmly thank you for your presentations and for engaging in this uh, conversation uh, afterwards, um, we will share the, the presentations and also the, the PowerPoints. And we can go to the last slide. Maybe on the last slide, we do have um, the announcement of the of the next uh, sessions. Do we? Um, uh, no, it's only thank you. <laughs> so let me uh, let me re remind all that on 12 May, there is uh, the next um, session in this mini series. And the next session will also be on the future of higher education in the short, medium and long term perspective. And then it will really go um, and look at the mid and low income countries. We will have a speaker from um, uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. We will have a speaker from um, Bangkok in Thailand. And um, in the third speaker is uh, help me out there. Um, from uh, Brazil. Um, so we will have three speakers from three different parts of the world to speak to those issues. And then on 19 May, we will have uh, a special webinar on the future of internationalization. You said so in the beginning, uh, uh, Ellen, as well. Everybody is also tempted to talk about internationalization, the future of internationalization that we will discuss in more detail, uh, also for short, medium and long term perspectives. Um, on 19 May. So you will find those there. And uh, again, a very warm thank you to you all, to Hans de Witt as well as, uh, as co-organizer and to Giorgio Marinoni uh, for the organization and for the content. Um, so Ahmed, Ellen and Roberta, um, this is only ce n'est qu'un au revoir and we will continue this discussion in many different forms and, and shapes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Maybe Hans and Giorgio, you want to come in on the video? I need. <laughs> Many friends in this chat box. <laughs> Hello.
<laughs> Stay safe too. Thank you for attending. <laughs>